might be a Viking or a Saxon or a Roman, but tell me, do you like them? Would you sex them? Would you bone them? Would you go to bed with King Ethelred? Would you bunk William the Conqueror up in the sheets with Samuel Pepys? Mussolini was a meanie, led a fascist insurrection, but does he make you creamy? Does he give you an erection? Would you pork Richard the Duke of York? Does a boner start when you think of Bonaparte? Are you sexually aroused at the thought of Pol Pot? Historical hot or not? Welcome to Historical Hot or Not. It's the only history podcast that looks at the life and times of history's most celebrated figures and asks, yes, but would you? It's the pod parchment that puts the sub in sub-Roman Britain, the dom in Dominican order, and whips the ass of history until it shouts out its safe word, David Starkey! I am Aid McCaffrey, I am your co-host, and this is... Catherine Mather, who is also a co-host. And a comedian, but we are not historians. Kath, this is the first podcast session that we've had since New Year, I mm-hmm. think that's right. Did you have a, a wonderful Christmas and New Year? I did, I had a great, um, both of those things. Me uh, and my other half, we went out for a, a lovely meal at this cute old pub and we got led into this little side room uh, and there was nobody else in it. There was a, a lovely log fire burning, it was raining outside, it was lovely. Uh, and we're like, this is the most romantic evening of our lives. And then a party of about 800 people came in, 700 <laughs> of whom were children. And um, I want to say, it's, they, were, they were very well behaved. They didn't spoil the vibe, but they didn't make the vibe better either. What a damn shame. Yeah, crying shame. How did you spend your New Year's? I went to Alicante for Christmas, to which Kath responded, oh, you're going on a trashy holiday. <laughs> Look, I'm a travel snob. It's one of those places like Falaraki, like Magaluf. I just didn't go because I just thought it was one of those places that annoying English people went to to basically have exactly the same food and drink diet, but on the sea. Mm-hmm. But actually, I was pleasantly surprised. I think Alicante is okay. Yeah. I, won't lie, I didn't do anything cultural. Usually when I go on holiday, I do like to visit a museum. The only museum I went to was called the History of Alicante, mm-hmm. and its address was en.wikipedia.org forward slash history of Alicante. <laughs> and I did it from the beach. Perfect. So go figure. Uh, I went to Magaluf once um, and it, it wasn't a party holiday. It was with my family and they were selling vodka Red Bull by the pint, <laughs> which <laughs> nobody needs a pint of vodka Red Bull. But I do want, you know, like when you go to a gig and they offer you, you know, they'll come in and be like, oh, do you want a drink? sometimes if you're an act i want that to be my drink um yeah yeah well actually i'll have a um <laughs> pint of vodka red bull please <laughs> like how was that invented did someone go i want to get drunk but i also don't want to sleep for a week i'll be right back yeah i want to shit myself and <laughs> be sad and violent what do you got barman <laughs> got the drink for you historical hot or not Kath, you want to reintroduce the concept for those people that don't know it? A hundred percent. So, uh, this is Historical Hot or Not, where each week we take it in turns, each episode. I don't know how frequently this goes out. I'm very uninvolved. Aidan is very much the driving (laughs) force behind everything (laughs) organisational. I turn up and occasionally do some research. Anyway, this is Historical Hot or Not, where each episode, me and Aidan will take it in turns to describe a historical figure to one another and pitch them as a sexual partner. We look at their e uh profile, uh, open up the e app, take a cheeky peek at their uh, profile picture and do a superficial assessment uh, and then we find out a little bit more about the character and then we decide whether we'd fuck them or not. If we would, they end up on the beer year tap battery. If not, they can Fuck off forever. So, Aidan, who have you got for me this week? Well, let's see where we go. Because in this season so far, mm-hmm. no one has ended up on the Bayo Tap Latistry. We've had uh, the Vlad the Impaler episode. We've had the Maggie Thatcher Milk Snatch episode. She didn't end up on it. Mm-hmm. So, will John C. Calhoun be the first person from season two to end up on the Bayo Tap Latistry? Let's find out. Kath, if you fuck, I'm just giving away who it is. Let's find out if this is going to be the first person to get on the BioTap Latter Street in season two. Kath, if you would like to open 
your e-troth dat. Yeah. I've sent you a bio. This is John. He is 68 and he is from Abbeville in South Carolina, although in this photo he is 40 years old. You know what? From this photo, yeah. Well, it's not a photo, is it? It's a painting. Um, I have a horrible feeling that I can I can kind of guess where this is going and, oh, I don't think I'll fancy him then. But he's got a very strong jawline, a solid head of hair. He's, uh, his facial hair... Well, he doesn't have any facial hair, but he's got a little bit of sideburn, but it's like a tasteful sideburn. It's not too much and too bushy. To be honest, his hairstyle looks quite um, modern. Uh, a little bit of the... I was thinking uh, that. On top. Not not a perm. I know that having a perm on top is kind of in fashion now, but it, it's certainly a bit wavy and styled, and I like that. It's got a lot of volume on the fringe. You're right. That's a very, like, 2020s thing. Uh, he's well-dressed. I like that. Uh, yeah. I am currently in. I haven't even given you much information about him, but you're already seeing red flags. What was the fla- red flag? Was it 19th century South Carolina? I think it was, Aidan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a rich white man. <laughs> <laughs> From the south of America in the 19th century, what could his sin be? I just can't <laughs> figure it out. Oh, no. Please tell me I'm wrong. Kath, let's find out. <laughs> I'm not wrong, am I? <laughs> hey! Let's not spoil the tension, all right, Kath? According to History.com, John Caldwell Calhoun, more commonly known as John C. Calhoun, was born into a large Scots-Irish family in rural South Carolina in March the 18th, 1782. According to Wikipedia, fearing Indian attacks, Calhoun's family had moved to South Carolina in 1756 to the state the adult John would later represent in the United States Senate. John's dad, Patrick, was known as an Indian fighter and an ambitious surveyor, farmer, planter and politician and was elected to the South Carolina legislature. Now, in the context of American history, Kath, Indian fighter feels like a bad nickname. Mm -hmm. It's like if you were British and you were called a Zulu shooter or you were a German and you were called a camper rector. Mm -hmm. It's not a good moniker. Kath, what two word noun verb combo are you hoping will be your legacy? Oh, good God. So uh, to clarify as well, just uh, before I answer your question, by Indian, I assume they mean Native American. Yes. Cool. Because to be fair, if you are leaving... Ireland in the 1800s to flee people from India. I can't imagine you would come into contact with too many people. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. It'd be like me leaving central London because of all all the snakes. Like there are no snakes. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> Just stay where you are. Enjoy your life. Stop worrying about hypotheticals. Two word noun verb combo. How about um, gravy boat wanker? Because um, <laughs> This was a a gift that I got um, from from a boyfriend, Reese, for Christmas. It is an Arbisto <laughs> gravy boat, which is, I mean, it's useful. Don't get me wrong, but um, it does feel a little bit like he's picking on me for being northern. Why have you got that with you now? Is that because during podcast recordings you just like to pour gravy directly into your mouth like the northern scum you are? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just uh, I keep it for, sorry, I keep my gravy. I'm also from the north, so I don't know why I'm slugging you off. Uh, I've actually got <laughs> gravy on a on a drip going into my arm as we speak. <laughs> yeah, they don't provide that down here, so we've got my <laughs> car on. I assume you've thought about this because you wrote it. What would you have? The reason I'm doing this podcast is I want my nickname to be Filth Purveyor. <laughs> Uh, which could apply to either of us, let's be fair. You can have Filth Purveyor, because I'm actually pretty sure that in the future, sunburnt generations are just going to record everyone alive now, regardless of our jobs. They're just going to call us carbon emitters. So mm. it doesn't matter what we do. They're not going to like us in 100 years. John's popper, Patrick, was not a patriot in the American Revolution and opposed the ratification of the federal constitution on grounds of state rights and personal liberties. He died when John was young and his brothers paid for the studious young lad to go to Yale College. Mm-hmm. Calhoun graduated and was admitted to the South Carolina Bar in 1807. In regards to his personal life, Calhoun married Floride Bono Colhoun, his first cousin once removed which feels positively progressive considering some of the literal sister bangers we've covered on this podcast. Right, Kath? Family trees, the 18th century man's tinder. Yeah, to be fair, uh, you know, they're, they're practically strangers. 
being this far removed from one another. <laughs> what I like about this story is he's called John C. Calhoun. His wife is called Fluid Calhoun. Like, I mean, I know he knows that it's his cousin, so it's like not an issue, but Kath's name is Catherine Mather. You came across someone on Tinder called Steve Mither <laughs> or Steve Moother. You wouldn't roll the dice, would you? Um, I mean, I live in London. There's 8 million people <laughs> here, so sure, why not? But um, I guess even if it was another Mather, I think I'd be, I would match with them because I'd be like, hey, <laughs> hey. You know, like when um, Taylor <laughs> Swift was going out with Taylor Lautner, and if they'd have both got married, they'd have both been called Taylor Lautner. <laughs> like, oh, God, I would force a relationship that wasn't working just to have that. Kath, I think you don't understand how genealogy works. Uh, <laughs> your, fir- your first names being the same is not the same as your last names being the same or even similar. <laughs> no, you're right. And if this is how you operate on Tinder, then your children are going to have some web feet. Let's just put it that way. And many, many eyes. How many times removed would a cousin have to be for you to bang them, Kath? How many degrees of separation before the incest feels just right? Well, so it depends on whether you grew up with them, doesn't it? That's one thing. Because if yeah. it is that they are a stranger, like if your cousin or second cousin turned it up, I would hell, I'd say an estranged cousin you've never met her before. She is <laughs> fucking beautiful and is into you. Would you say no? You're allowed. You don't know her. She's a stranger. I think that a lot of us would fuck cousins uh, under the right circumstances. So I'm not saying I'd no to it. I mean, I am, because I know all of my cousins, but <laughs> hypothetically. I, I know I fully agree. I, I'd actually take it further. I wouldn't just do first cousins. I'd do first cousins minus one, which is my, my sister. That's, that's how I'd, I'd do it. Now, I don't have a sister, so that's easy for me to say. But mm-hmm. I'm thinking hypothetically here. And if she looks like me, she must be fit, so I'm in. But again, there's that whole thing, isn't there, where um, with families that have been uh, reunited after adoptions and things, it's quite a common phenomena that you sort of fall, well, can fall in love with that person because it, it is trying to sort of make up for the lost in- intimacy of childhood is the theory behind it. Because, you know, I guess as kids, it's totally fine to sort of hug and kiss and stuff because it's cute and uh, it's... Yeah. But when you get older, it's less socially accepted and your brain sort of <laughs> interprets it as, oh, I want to hug and kiss her, therefore we want to fuck. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, it's not funny. It's just it's just a fact I learned. If you're not laughing, you're learning. My wife and I do actually share a common name in our genealogical history. <gasps> you married a cousin. <laughs> so it's like, it's like 300 years back. She's got Ukrainian blood in her. Basically, I think that Ukrainian blood's going to have to do a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to our kids' genetic diversity. Mm-hmm. Have you asked Reese, what, your boyfriend Reese? Have you asked him what his surname is? Yeah, I know what his surname is. And, it, and it's not Mither. No, no, it's not. It's uh, Mother. <laughs> oh, you're probably fine then. Mither, red flag, Mother. That's absolutely fine. According to BBCNews.com, it's twenty generations before you find an individual who is a common ancestor of everyone in the population. So really, we're all just fucking our cousins. Cousins John and Floride had 10 children. That's 100 webbed toes, if you count and calf. Wow. (laughs) This family had more webbed toes than a biblical frog plague. (laughs) I am so glad I'm not her. President John Quincy Adams, later famous for his opposition to slavery. Can't imagine that's going to come up again in this episode. He said of Calhoun... He is above all sectional and factious prejudices more than any other statesman of the Union with whom I have ever acted. According to Britannica.com, Calhoun's two books on government published posthumously and his many cogent speeches in Congress have gained him a reputation as one of the country's foremost original political theorists. And according to Senate.gov, in choosing a list of the five most outstanding historical senators to honour in the Capitol's Senate reception room, 160 scholars narrowed the field of well over 1,000 former senators down to 65 candidates. The committee, led by future President John F. Kennedy, first picked the three senators whose legislative compromises held the country together in the decades leading to the Civil War. One of these three was John C. Calhoun. And one final thing. John C. Calhoun was six foot two. 
You like tall men, right, Cass? I do, yeah. I mean, it's it's all sounding good so far. I think that's everything. Based on everything I've said, would, would you bang John C. Calhoun? Yeah, but I'm just waiting for the other boots to drop. Well, hang on, I missed. I just missed a very small detail. John C. Calhoun spent his entire four-decade political career opposing any attempt to abolish or even compromise on the existence of slavery, contributing more than any politician of the time to a creed and philosophy that elevated states' rights in defense of slavery above all considerations, including the Union, a philosophy that would lead to civil war, the deaths of over 600,000 soldiers, and the continued prosperity of slavery and slaveholders and the suffering of those slaves within until the culmination of said war. But... That's not going to have any bearing on your decision, is it, Kath? Oh, it might do. It might do, actually. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Come on. He was doing so well. I find it so incredible that people left Scotland and Ireland in this time. You know when the English were not entirely wonderful to <laughs> the Irish or the Scottish? Hey, I, we've always, we've always been... Lovely people, capital L, capital P. <laughs> but to leave your home, not through choice, but because the English have been like, work till you die, and you will die because there's no food or houses, to then go to another country and be like, yep, slavery, yeah, no bother. I, <laughs> I just, I don't understand. You've better than anybody. You know, if we were to remove empathy from the situation, just just a, a basic human understanding of, of what other people might be feeling. What? Yeah, I, I mean, it's this whole, oh, yes, we want states' rights and religious liberty, so we're going to America. And then what about just general liberty of people, mm. not just for white landowners? What about that general liberty that's like doesn't apply to them? <sighs> no. In 1811, John C. Calhoun was elected to the South Carolina's 6th District as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. The following year, in response to the British trade embargoes, the House and Senate voted to go to war with Britain. Now, I'm not saying Calhoun was overly enthusiastic about going to war, but there were reports of him dancing on the House floor with two pom-poms, a tight top with USA emblazoned on it, while he chanted, USA, go, 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 we don't want no embargo, and he looked damn cute doing it. Damn cute. Oh, I can imagine he would. He's, he, he's quite a good-looking fella, isn't he? Kath, the War of 1812, nearly a three-year war, 15,000 Americans dead, 8,000 British and Canadian. Guess what the result was? Uh, did we lose? Uh, according to Wikipedia, inconclusive. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what you want, that's what you want blood spilt for, isn't it? It's yeah. annoying enough when a football match comes to a draw. Imagine if United and City were bayoneting each other to a <laughs> nil-nil conclusion. Oh, no, Rashford's being cannonballed and for nothing. <laughs> It's annoying enough when you provide a blood test, like you give a blood stamp, <laughs> oh, yeah. and uh, it's got mixed up oh. a bit in the uh, in the lab, and it's inconclusive. Oh, I've got to go and give it again now. Kath, I fucking hate getting my blood taken. I really hate it, and yeah. it's so annoying when they bring you back and they're like, "Oh, we mislabeled it. Can you come and do it again?" And your just arm is purple from the last bruise, and you're like, <laughs> "I don't want it." Native Americans fought alongside both sides in this war, which I found interesting. Mm. Kath, guess how many Native Americans died in this battle, according to battlefields.org? I have no idea, but I think it will be disproportionate to the white people. Uh, you could say that, Kath. According to battlefields.org, the number of Native Americans that died in this war is not known. They didn't even bother to fucking count. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> These fucking people. I know. Shall we count the natives we killed? Looks at the battlefield. Oh, well, it's a bit of a job. We don't need to count all the natives that died literally for us in this battle. Yeah, I mean, Mac is shut at 11. So. <laughs> Do you want a bit of tea on the way home? Oh, yeah, you're right. Let's not count them. Do you want an even more fun fact? An even more white fact than that? Mm, go on. So battlefields.org at least acknowledges that people died who were Native Americans but they don't know how many. Some websites mm. don't even acknowledge that this fact isn't known. Some of these websites that I looked at just say, this is how many Brits died, this is how many Canadians died, this is how many Americans died. Moving on. 
Ah. Uh, yeah, it's not good, is it? Oh, no, it sucks so bad. Kath, what's the biggest statistical oversight you've made in your job? Oh, one time. Uh, it wasn't my statistical error, but uh, a chef just... I was working a waitressing job and a chef just did not make 20 people their dinner. Oh, and that was the, the event that the Queen was at. The, you got like a, a zero hour contracted uh, waiter arguing on about £6.50 an hour arguing with this chef uh, that, that, you know, <laughs> the fucking Queen's hungry. And he's like, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> You're supposed to put the orders on this bar up here. I can't see an order for bangers and mash. I don't care if it's a fucking Queen. <laughs> How's she paying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, how about you? Uh, I used to have a job counting government departments, and uh, I forgot to count the National Statistics Office. Yay! But I did count the National Irony Department. Yay! In 1817, Calhoun was appointed the Secretary of War. According to Wikipedia, he proposed an elaborate programme of national reforms to the infrastructure that he believed would speed economic modernization. In 1824, he helped create the Bureau of Indian Affairs, whose responsibility was to manage treaty negotiations, school and trade with Indians, and as, and as a result of which, nothing bad happened to Indians. Mm. Apart from forced assimilation, educating Indian kids in boarding schools that prohibited them from using their indigenous languages, practices and cultures. Of course! How that was never going to end in a happy way, was it? No, again, having family from scotland and ireland where that is literally happening to them as well absolute bastard as long as you're doing it to someone else kath it's fine yeah in 1825 he became vice president to john quincy adams and then in 1829 to andrew jackson john calhoun's career is a good example of the positive correlation between being a prick and rising to the top in politics yeah it it does seem that it's only pricks that can rise doesn't it Mine certainly does, when I'm talking about John C. Calhoun. Anyway, uh, <laughs> during the Jackson administration, Calhoun's wife, Floride, nee Calhoun, lest we forget, mm. organised cabinet wives against the Secretary of War, John Eaton's wife, Peggy, on the grounds that their relationship had started via an extramarital affair. Some historians, including Richard B. Iatna and Robert V. Ramini, believed the whole affair was a mask for other political divisions, particularly the amusingly named tariff of abominations now this was a nickname for the bill but what a nickname you know i want more laws like that Mm. i want the abhorrent tax credit i want (laughs) the abominable minimum wage i want rishi and the terrible horrible no good very bad healthcare bill that's what i want from british politics just be honest about it it's fuck you over friday (laughs) Yeah, go for the abhorrent tax credit. You'll probably still beat Labour. We're very bad at winning elections. (laughs) Kath, I know this is meant to be a sexy history podcast, Mm -hmm. but strap in because this podcast is about to get tariff heavy. Okay. I sincerely hope your kink is import duties because I'm about to talk about them a lot. Listeners, if your fetish is economic protectionism, then get ready for the money shot because here it comes. I tell you what, Aidan, I've switched off already. Please, go on. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're supposed to be wet at the thought of mercantilism. But anyway, Calhoun had for years been a proponent of nullification theory. This is a theory that if a state ruled a law unconstitutional, it could have no effects within state borders. The, null- the nullification crisis regarded the 1832 tariff, which, unlike the earlier tariff of abominations, didn't have a fun nickname, even though its effects were more explosive. Uh, so let's just call it the truly hateful gobshite of a tariff. Mm-hmm. I don't know or care if the contents of the tariff are bad. I just think it deserves a fun name. Yeah. According to the Avalon Project, on November the 24th, the South Carolina Nullification Convention passed an ordinance nullifying both the Tariff of 1832 and the Tariff of 1828 and threatening to secede if the federal government attempted to enforce the bills. Calhoun compromised on a bill with higher rates in exchange for wider support in his supposition to executive threat. The next day, Congress passed the force bill, which would allow the president to use the military to force the states to accept the law. This is the funny bit. South Carolina accepted the tariff, but nullified the force bill, which only existed to force them to accept the tariff in the first place. So it's like really petty Face saving. It'd be like if Liz Truss said, 
I reject that the Conservative Party has selected Rishi Sunak as the new Prime Minister. And in protest, I'm going to order a taxi to take me and all of my belongings from 10 Downing Street to my house in Norfolk. And I'm also going to leave a congratulations on the new job and fruit basket in number 10 for Rishi. All right, suck on that. <laughs> yeah, tell me what to do. Uh, I'll do what you tell me to do, but I'll act like I haven't. That's effectively what South Carolina <laughs> have done in this situation. Looking good, Alan. Kath, what's the uh, pettiest thing you've done to save face? I mean, I don't know if this counts, but I, I once, uh, when I was clearing out my locker uh, at a job that I I was leaving, I left a shrine to certain behind in it. <laughs> Um, so when they came to clear it out, they'd be like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, just a few How... a few graphic images and some candles. That's very good for it. That's, that's like Beats. After George W. Bush allegedly stole the, 20, the 2000 election, yeah. the outgoing Democrats, who were hoping to work for the Al Gore administration, apparently stole all the Ws off the keyboards, <laughs> which is quite fun. I love it. How about you? What's yours? Uh, oh, it's not big. I'm just like a kind of, I'll do the dishes, but only because I want to do them and not because you've been asking for me to do them for three days kind of guy. Mm-hmm. I like to try and just make it seem like it was my decision, yeah. even though I've very clearly been begrudging in doing the task in the first place. Mm-hmm. After years of tension with President Jackson on the nullification and states' rights issues, Calhoun resigned as vice president and South Carolina elected Calhoun to represent them in the Senate. This is all part of the states' rights debate, which was resulted in the Civil War, and which is in the present day we more commonly associate states' rights as a dog whistle to racists. Mm -hmm. States' rights is very much the N-word for people too smart to say the N-word, but too stupid to not hate blacks. Okay. After 11 years in the Senate, opposing government encroachment, big business, and what he perceived as anti-Southern tariffs, Calhoun quit the Senate to run for president. According to Wikipedia, he gained little support, (laughs) even from the South, and quit. That's a nice slap in the face from the people whose interest he's been working in for literally (laughs) for fucking ever. Nah, not you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah be like imagine if you just couldn't get a gig in manchester <laughs> it's like the one place you couldn't it's like i'm literally a manchester comedian trying to do my <laughs> bit for northern women comedians and it's like yeah but fuck you we're not going to book you <laughs> anyway in 1844 john tyler named calhoun as secretary of state tyler had been promoting the annexation of texas from mexico southern slaveholders wanted to expand slavery into this new american territory according to wikipedia tyler argued that the further introduction of slavery into the vast expanses of Texas and beyond, they argued, would diffuse rather than concentrate slavery regionally, ultimately weakening white attachment and dependence on slave labor. So his logic is, if we spread a small knob of butter over a large piece of toast, in some ways there'll be less butter. But I think what actually happens is, if you make it legal for people to sell butter, they will breed cows. I think that's what actually happens in that situation. Yeah, and if you put a small knob of butter on toast, the toast tastes bad because it's dry. Does this not go with the metaphor? What are you talking about? If you put butter on toast, it's... No, but if you don't put enough butter on... Oh, right, a small knob as opposed to a large knob. Yeah, what are you talking about, Aidan? Why are we talking about toast? It has been a long day. And I'm tired. If you put your dick on a bit of toast, right. someone might put it in their mouth. That's what I've been trying to say. That's what Got the yeah. metaphor was. <laughs> right, okay. Now it makes sense. Sorry, continue. <laughs> this whole D- Texas affair culminated in Calhoun striking a deal with the presidential candidate, James Polk, that he would support his candidacy if, among other things, he supported the annexation of Texas, which he did. Texas was annexed and slavery prospered over the next decade and a half of antebellum statehood, according to tsl.texas.gov. By 1860, there were 182,566 enslaved, which was 30% of the total population of the state. That's insane. Yeah. Kath, what's the most number of people you've thrown under the bus to get a job? I've never thrown anyone under a physical bus. If you were becoming a bus driver... Yeah. That would be like, you could throw the other applicants under the bus and then you could drive over them. But then that mm. might stop you from getting the job because they'd be like, your qualifications are great, your CV looks good, you've been driving buses for 10 years, 
but you did drive literally over two people who are also waiting to interview. So yeah, you did kill all of the other candidates, and for that reason, we can't offer you the position. <laughs> uh, uh, the most people I've thrown under a bus to get a job was I allowed slavery to prosper in Rutland oh. so I could get a, a Saturday job as a pot wash, which in yeah. retrospect was a poor trade for both parties. Yeah, nobody enjoyed that. Historical hot or not. In an 1847 Senate floor speech, Calhoun countered Southern slaveholders who believed it was a necessary evil, saying, The relation now existing in the slaveholding states between the two is instead of an evil, a good, a positive good. In regards to the spread of slavery into the soon-to-be annexed territory of Texas, Calhoun wrote this to the British ambassador Richard Pakenham. The census and other authentic documents show that in all instances in which the states have changed the former relation between the two races, the condition of the African has become worse. They have sunk into vice and pauperism, accompanied by the bodily and mental afflictions incident thereto, deafness, blindness, insanity, and idiocy. While in all the other states which have retained the ancient relation between them, they have improved greatly in number, comfort, intelligence, and morals. It may be added that in no age or country has the Negro race ever attained so high an elevation in morals, intelligence, and civilization. <laughs> what do you make of that, Kath? I think he's talking out of his arsehole. <laughs> because when the slaves were freed, it wasn't like, well, there you go, here's a house, here's some clothes, here's an education, have a wonderful time, here's a job. Yeah. You know, the, the slaveholders... Um, got uh, killy, killy, yeah. They did get quite killy, uh, and they also uh, they they got got money, financial compensation. I, I think that if you are set free, it, although it's not freedom, is it? If you've got no money, no job, and everyone's trying to kill you, I don't know that that is the best, healthiest environment to flourish and thrive in, is it? And maybe that's got something to do with something. I agree. Yeah, if no one gives you a job, or to put it in a more specific way, the only job they give you is news tester. Maybe freedom isn't quite what it was promised in the first place. No. According to u-s-history.com, in the later part of his distinguished Senate career, Calhoun vigorously and successfully opposed the Wilmot Proviso, which would have banned slavery in newly acquired territories. According to Slavery in the United States, Volume 1, by Junius P. Rodriguez, Calhoun said, There never has yet existed a wealthy and civilized society in which one portion of the community did not, in point of fact, live on the labor of the other. Now, to be fair to Calhoun, he is right there. Mm. But that's a bit like if I said, look, there's always going to be murder. So what the hell? Give me that Uzi and drive me to the nearest shopping center. That's essentially what he's saying here. It's like, well, someone's always going to live on the back of someone else. So let's just let slavery prosper in as much land as humanly possible. Okay, yeah, just relax into it. It'd be great. We'll have a wonderful time. The modern equivalent would be like, there's always going to be some poor people somewhere making your shit for you, I guess. Sweatshops. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean it's slavery, but it can be pretty damn close to it. So It's nice that we can keep these traditions going, isn't it? <laughs> John C. Calhoun would be very proud of us now. Mm. He says recording this on his iPhone, which was <laughs> uh, almost certainly made by some uh, poor Bl Bangladeshi kids. Ethically sourced. <laughs> yeah. This is not an ethically sourced podcast, people. At 67, and while suffering from tuberculosis, Calhoun wrote his most famous speech, An Attack on the Compromise of 1850, an attempt by Stephen A. Douglas to solve the issue of slavery in new territories, advocating for succession if more powerful northern states continued to interfere with the southern institution of slavery. Here's what I like about this guy. Even while he is sweating to death from TB, he still found energy to be a total bella. <laughs> you know, if I was dying of TB, I think I'd struggle to make a sandwich, let alone split a country into bloody <laughs> civil war. Just take a day off being a cunt, man. It's a shame, isn't it, that he's written that speech and yet he won't be able to deliver it on account of his broken lungs. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I think he did, though. Oh, did he? I, don't know. I can't remember what I said now. It just took, it took him a really long time to say it. <laughs> it was really, really boring. John, John, no, honestly, John, John, it's okay. I'll read it for you if you want. <laughs> <laughs> 
no, I, I'm going to do it. It effectively became a filibuster. It took him so long to do. It wasn't meant to be a filibuster. I just am I'm dying of shitloads. <laughs> Kath, guess what uh, John C. Calhoun's last words were? Oh, God. Was it, um, yay, slavery? <laughs> Might as well have been. His last words were, the South, the poor South. <laughs> what, what, what a dick imagine if like he's the kind of guy who would probably watch 12 years of slave and go god those poor slave owners <laughs> always have to have them to deal with uppity slaves mm. i hope the whip was okay after they whipped that poor girl with it. will no one give the rich white man a break always being yes. villainized because of their words and <laughs> actions <laughs> If anything, that's what I'm hoping the legacy of this podcast will be, that we <laughs> just cast a little bit of light on how poor white men have had it in history. <laughs> the Senate.gov quote, JFK first picked the three senators whose legislative compromises held the country together in the decades leading to civil war. One of these three was John C. Calhoun. This is mental. And mm. this is one of the weird things about American history, how they so brushed the issue of slavery under the carpet for 100 years. Mm -hmm that JFK himself was literally claiming that the compromises of this man held the country together when it, it literally they are the opposite. He basically contributed to a rhetorical and intellectual framework that supported secession in the name of states' rights, in the name of defending the institution of slavery. Like, he actively encouraged people to do it, and 100 years later... JFK is going, God, it was really great all that work this guy did holding the country together, which is just literally not what happened at all. Look how strong his jawline is, though. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> the jawline gets him into this uh, uh, legendary senators list. Do you think, Aidan, that there is anything that you could do as a person, as an individual, uh, to absolve you of being heavily involved or indeed involved at all in the slave trade. Kath, you're looking at it, this excellent beard. <laughs> that is a very straight beard that I have groomed exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. And whatever I've done in my life, when I go to heaven, I don't care if I've owned a thousand slaves, I'm just going to point at this and go, you know beards are in, and therefore I'm in heaven. Yeah, they'll be like, right this way, sir. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the Confederate, according to Wikipedia, the Confederate government honoured Calhoun on a one cent postage stamp, which is printed in 1862, but never officially released. Now, like, I don't believe in guilt by association, Kath, but if the Confederate States of America are putting you on a stamp, think about your life choices. If the Third Reich says, we'd like to put your face <laughs> on a dinner plate, it might not be because your face looks particularly good under a Frankfurter. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but also uh, it's worth noting that the Confederate States designed the postage stamp and I went nah nah not that cunt <laughs> he's too bad for us he might give us a bad name <laughs> <laughs> in 1887 at the height of the Jim Crow era when white segregationists erected a monument to Calhoun in Marion Square in Charleston South Carolina the base was within easy reach and the local black population defaced it yes <laughs> Finally, it was replaced in 1896, standing atop a column base, at a total of, <laughs> wait for it, Kath, 115 feet. Like, wow. Again, if they have to place your statue on top of K2 <laughs> to stop aggrieved blacks from defacing it, maybe you were a racist. Just maybe you were a racist. Yeah. Just don't put the statue back up. Maybe it doesn't need to be there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wikipedia, according to Wikipedia, thanks to protests from the Make It Right project, uh, this statue was eventually removed in 2020 following a unanimous vote by the Charleston City Council to replace it. In response to decades of requests, Yale President Peter Salovey announced in 2017 that the university's Calhoun College would be renamed to honour Grace Murray Hopper, a pioneering computer programmer, mathematician and Navy Rear Admiral who graduated from Yale. So there's a little bit of a win there. But 2020, Aidan, 2020. That is so, so recent. Kath, there's so much stuff like this. Oh, why? No, but this is the thing. It took 100 years for America to just start asking the question, like, oh, maybe these guys were dicks. But it still took another 30, 40, 50 years for them to actually start taking these statues down and renaming these colleges. It's been 150 years. Well, we all Mental. know what this guy did. It's all, it's all on record. He worked so hard to reject the slightest compromise. Because, you know, at the time, it wasn't like there was 
pro-slavery people and abolitionists. Mm -hmm. The anti-slavery movement was made up of everyone from full-on abolitionists who just think you should ban it to people who didn't who thought it was bad but like weren't sure what to do about it. In the same way that now, like there are people that are like think we should save the environment, but mm -hmm. they're not entirely sure how to wean us off fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. This is where this, the uh, the uh, expansion of slavery into new states comes in. Because some people just thought, if you stop it from going into new states, it'll eventually be contained and die out naturally. Mm -hmm. and, and and the whole time, Calhoun was like, no, slavery is good. We're keeping it where it is. And we're going to have it in the new states as well. It's just like, More, please. how did it take a century and a half for people to sort of figure out that this guy was a bellend? It's mental. Oh, it's equally, though. We, uh, the British, have got enough statues of fucking cunts <laughs> knocking around as well, haven't they? And I just, yeah. I'm so grateful that all of those people went down to Bristol and uh, just threw yeah. one in the fucking sea. More, more in the sea. And my favourite part of all of that was that somebody then changed the marker for the statue and put it into the sea <laughs> on Google Maps. <laughs> That's very fair. <laughs> Kath, an another little weird example of how long it took his legacy to do. The USS John C. Calhoun, a James Madison fleet ballistic missile submarine, was named after him. Was that made in 1820? No, no fuck it wasn't. This is a post-World War II <laughs> ballistic missile submarine. I can only think it was decommissioned because uh, a design flaw meant that it only attacked African countries. That's my that's my guess. And refused to budge on anything. <laughs> yeah. He also had some lakes named after him, but they have since been renamed to their Dakota language names. I will say this, like, he was clearly an intelligent man. And I sort of think that maybe his mm. legend comes from, if you are charismatic, intelligent, and you were in command of a room, that in itself could make you a legend, regardless of what you do. It, it's like the legend of intelligent mm -hmm. people who wed themselves to stupid causes. Mm -hmm. It's like I was reading about um, Ben Shapiro, you know, the conservative mouthpiece. The, the guy mm -hmm. skipped two grades in school and he graduated university at the age of 20. He's probably more intelligent on a purely academic basis than you and me put together. But imagine having all that intelligence, mm -hmm. all that intelligence, and the conclusion you arrive at is homosexuality is a mental illness. Mm -hmm. Intelligent people just attach themselves to just stupid bullshit that is easily, you can easily take apart intellectually. They're just not willing to do it. No, I guess it's not having real world experience, isn't it? Just living in a little bubble and refusing to accept any new information on that thing. Yeah, exactly. It's like, Ben Shapiro, you're smart. Why don't you just figure out how to make an electric car that costs the same as a push bike? It's like, no, I'd rather slag off gays on my podcast. It's like, fine, you do you. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to say, you've got a good IQ. Maybe use it for something more worthwhile. Instead of being a piece of shit. <laughs> in, in, yeah, a piece of actual shit, capital A, capital S. Historical hot or not. Kath. John C. Calhoun, fighting to maintain slavery. Is that a quim closer or an orifice opener for you? <laughs> My quim is closed. Um, it's just, it's difficult, isn't it? Because I've seen people complain on dating apps because people have written no Tories. But equally, I think that you need to have a certain amount of mutual understanding and uh, base ethics to work from in a partnership don't you i think if you can just say no tourists then that's a nice easy way of just yeah. not having to go out and spend money on drinks to speak to some cunt in a bar isn't it so i just think <laughs> if it was a one night stand and he just he didn't speak to me at all um sure uh, i would and if you know every time he was like what are your thoughts i'd be like shh, shh, shh. Shh, no, honey, no words, no words. <laughs> no, 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 you're doing really well, honey. You're doing really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I don't want to. I don't want to know anything about what you think at no. all. <laughs> it is of no consequence to me. Shut up. Um, in that case, yeah. But I think if I knew about his terrible, terrible personality and thoughts, then that would be a real boner kill for me. So I'm going to go no. It's an overall no. John C. Calhoun, the Quim Shack is closed for business. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> <laughs> they always say don't judge historical people by today's standards. The difference with Calhoun is he's actively making people's lives miserable, mm -hmm. restraining their liberty, and c contributing to a system which is physically harming and killing people. 
you know mm. what I mean, turns and turning them into property. So I think we, you know, don't judge historical people by today's standards. No, I think we can. I think yeah. that phrase makes about as much sense as don't judge a book by its ISBN number, don't judge a judge by its gavel, and uh, don't throw stones in glass houses. It's less dangerous if you step outside and do it from there. I agree. I think that a cunt is a cunt no matter what time period it's in. It sounds like people knew that he was an <laughs> asshole. Do you want to see one fun thing before we wrap up? There's yeah. one thing I like about John C. Calhoun, and that is, it's not his personality. Of course not. His personality is a garbage fire. <gasps> Have you got a dick pic? <laughs> I w- when you see the photo I'm about to send you, you fucking wish I had a dick pic, Kath. This. Oh, okay. So he's han- he was a handsome young man. As an old man, he looked fucking mental. Check out this picture, Kath. That I've just sent you on the e-troth map. Oh, good God. <laughs> wow. Okay. I know this picture. Oh, you've seen it before? I've seen this picture of him, yeah. And he looks nightmarish. He looks like Doc Brown from Back to the Future's racist older brother. Just massive mm. wild hair. Just the most terrifying eyes. He just looks like the kind of person if that if you kicked your football into their yard as a child you just immediately be like, well, I've never seen that football again because that's where the scary old man who looks like a racist zombie lives. Yeah, he looks like, you know, if you get a toy that's got like a a hollow plastic head that's a bit squishy and then you push it, the face in (laughs) to it. He looks like that. That's, that jawline is gone. Yeah, yeah. He looks like years of bitter horribleness has come out on his face. You know how like now people get progressively more racist their face becomes more a gammony red. Maybe back then that's what happened. You were so like into sort of white supremacy your neck gave way his collarbone collapsed under the weight of his own racist thoughts Um, (laughs) uh, Listeners, if you go to the notes section of this app, you could play along, you can assess whether you would uh, have sex with the Young John C. Calhoun, and also toss in this image of John C. Calhoun as a weird old man with no neck, because it's quite funny. So, he did not make it onto the Bayeux Tap That Astray, uh, which is a shame, but not a shame. Another one bites the dust. Remember, you can always find us on social media, 